sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people in Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Let's pray together. Father, we desire to be a blessing in your eyes. We truly do. We also desire, Father, to know you much better, much more intimately, much more experientially than we do. And so our prayer is that you will continually reveal yourself to us through your word. Lord, we understand the word is the key to all of this, and I pray that message will penetrate our hearts today even more. I ask, Father, for those who are in difficult places around our world today, for those who are certainly not able to participate in worship in anything like the way we do. In fact, they are suffering humiliation. They are suffering beatings. They are suffering, in some cases, the threats of death and the reality of death all over our world because they name the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we pray, Father, that your name will be hallowed and that your kingdom will come and that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that from the depths of our being. We long for that. We pray that in the meantime, Father, you will bring comfort to those who are afflicted not only those who are far away, but even those who are right here, those who are in our midst, whatever the affliction is, however bad it may be, we ask for your, for your help. We pray for your comfort. We pray for your strength. We pray that you will be with those who are missionaries in far places, difficult places, tough places, discouraging places. We ask that you will encourage their hearts. We pray that the financial support that they need will be available Lord, sometimes it may seem like we're asking for a lot. We want money for a building fund. We want money for missionaries. We want money for a free day, this and that and the other thing. But Lord, you have blessed us beyond any people in history. For us not to be giving what we can because you've said, here's why I give it to you, so you can give it back, not so you can hoard it. Help us to be faithful. I... I'm so thankful, Father, for this congregation of people who give above and beyond. And I pray that you will bless as we continue to look forward to what you will do through us, but help us to realize it will take sacrifice. We must be willing to do that for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so much less than many others are, the price that many others are paying. I pray for the Losies this morning as they look for visas in order to be able to continue to go to this country where they are translating your word. I pray for little Daniel as his heart continues to work and you continue to more or less do a miracle in his life. And we pray that you'll continue to do that until he's old enough for further help. But Lord, bless that family who has really defines to us what it means to give everything for the sake of Jesus Christ. And Lord, they're just the tip of the iceberg. So many others I pray for each one. And Lord, now help your word to penetrate our hearts. Lord, we pray that it be your word. We pray that it be your Holy Spirit who teaches us. For the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. First time I was ever in Boston. Uh, if, if any of you have been, been, you may have the same experience, but I found out very quickly that it's very different from the place where I lived in Southern California. In Southern California, if you want to go to Disneyland or SeaWorld, you just follow the signs. You, know, you don't need a GPS, you just follow the signs. You can get on Highway Interstate 5, anywhere between Los Angeles and San Diego, and find whatever you want by following the signs. The closer you get, the bigger the signs. We just tell out of, friend, out of, out of town friends, if they were going to one of these places, follow the signs. It's not like that in Boston. There are no signs in Boston. There are a few signs in Boston, but they're small signs in Boston, and they're very unhelpful. And they're not, you have to be right on top of the thing. So the first time I was there, I was looking for the historical things, right? Faneuil Hall, 
the Boston Tea Party, Old North Church, drove around for hours, literally trying to find these things, finally had to ask directions, okay? <laughs> Last resort. So I asked directions, and eventually I found this little sign on the wharf that said the Boston Tea Party happened here December 12, 1773. That was it. It's the only sign I ever saw. I finally found one for the Old North Church, one block away from the Old North Church. But I can tell you this, you would have never found it if you hadn't asked, because you could put a, you could put a, you could put a torch in the steeple today, and nobody would see it except the high rise across the street, right? There's no way you could find it. Now, years later, I went back to Boston on business. And one day I was looking for Winter Street in downtown Boston. So I drove around the Boston Common a couple times. I found Summer Street, and I thought, winter's got to be close. <laughs> parking was difficult, and the parking place was right there, so I parked, right, thinking I'll just walk and find this. Two hours walking across the Boston Common. No Winter Street. Finally, I had to ask directions. <laughs> And when I asked directions, here's what they told me. They said, go two blocks down Winter Street, uh, down Summer Street, and it turns into Winter Street. <laughs> Summer turns into winter. <laughs> Who knew? That's Boston. I learned that signs are not always dependable. And what's true physically is also true spiritually. Signs are not dependable. And yet we have thousands of people today worshiping at the shrine of the spectacular, looking for signs. Signs to help them know that God is real. Signs to display somehow in their mind the power of God, produce a tingly feeling to get their own selfish desire, whether it's what God really wants or not. Signs. Faith depends on signs producing on demand. Some awe-inspiring miracle. Something that will just, you know, kind of shake your socks off. And then when the sign doesn't come, we have discouragement, we have frustration, and sometimes downright just kind of walking away from God. It, re it reminds me of Sam Samuel Goldwyn, who once said, you know, when it, when it came to making movies, he wanted his movies to start with an earthquake and then work up to a climax. It's a little bit how we look at the Christian faith. I want the spectacular. I want the shortcut to maturity. I want signs. Now, I think when we're doing that, beloved, we're operating outside of God's plan and purpose for this time. Now listen really, really carefully. Does that mean God never does miracles today? Not at all. God does unbelievable miracles every day. Every day, hurting, pained, <laughs> suffering, Rebellious people come to faith in Christ and he makes new creations out of them. There's no physical miracle that even comes close to that miracle. Happens every day. Every day there's the providential miracle that surround you, every one of us who have faith in Christ that bring about the promise that God gives us in Romans 8, 28 where he says that all things, all things, even not being able to find your direction in Boston. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That takes providential miracles. Not nature bending, but providential. Nevertheless, the hand of God is there in every action in our life. We can never limit God. But you say, well, what about those nature-defying miracles? Don't those happen? The answer is yes, they do. But beloved, they are not the norm, God's norm for this time and place. They simply aren't. 
And to expect that they are or to build our faith on them is to ask for trouble. In all of history, there have been three great periods of miraculous activity of the, na- of the kind that just are nature-bending. During the time of the release of the children of Israel from captivity in Egypt, around 1450 BC, there were some of the most magnificent, glorious, and mighty miracles that have ever been seen in history, right? And those people were delivered because God displayed himself in great might and power at that point in time. He chose to do that. But I would remind you that for hundreds of years following that, God kept reminding the children of Israel, remember what I did back there instead of giving them a new one here and now. He did. Read the Bible. The second great period of miracles was during the time of Elijah and Elisha. When God was trying to help his people understand You need to be worshiping me instead of idols. Let me make really clear how great I am. And there was a period of great miracles that happened during that period of time. The third great time of miracles in the nature, in, in history, occurred during the time of Jesus Christ, of course, in the early days of the apostolic era. Never have have there been miracles like we're going on there. John says, look, I've given you seven here in this book. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John give a whole bunch more. But John says, listen, if I wrote all the miracles that Jesus did, the whole world couldn't contain the books. It's a slight exaggeration, but you get the point. Jesus hardly moved without miracles happening during that period of time. But other than those periods, verifiable Definable miracles have been seldom and rare and not the norm. Now we might ask ourselves, well, why is that? Well, first of all, because God wants us to live by faith and not by certainty, right? He wants that. In fact, he doesn't just want it, he demands it. This is the way you will know me, by faith. Remember what he told Thomas when Thomas said, I'm not, I'm not going to believe unless I see it with my own eyes, unless I touch, touch the nail prints in his hand and the, and, and the side. I'm not going to believe, even though you guys tell me I'm not going to believe this resurrection. And, and, and when he saw Jesus, remember what he did? He bowed down and worshiped him. He said, my Lord and my God. And then what did Jesus say? He said, blessed are you, Thomas, but blessed more are those who do not see and will not see but will still believe. But thirdly, the second, or secondly, the cure for unbelief, beloved, the cure for unbelief is not miracles. The cure for unbelief is the Word of God. The cure for unbelief is the Word of God. That's how He has chosen during this time and during this space to capture our hearts. He tells us that over and over. In his word, right? It says the word of God is sharper and more powerful than any two-edged sword. He says the word of God is, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, is sufficient for training, reproof, correction, teaching. All the things that you need that the man and woman of God may be complete, complete, complete. You mean you can be complete with just the word of God? Yes! That's what he's saying. He says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of Christ. Not the miracles of Christ. The word of Christ. Miracles will be plentiful in our future. They will. You're going to see things that you can't even imagine. But beloved, for right now, the the God is asking us to be concentrated on his word. He's asking us to let that be the center of our lives. He desires those who love and trust him for himself, not for his blessings. There are no shortcuts to spiritual maturity through the route of the supernatural. We become mature, proportionate to the time we spend in God's word and in prayer. That's the way he's arranged it for now. Signs 
are not dependable as foundations of faith. The Word is. The Word is. That's the message of our text. Now, the background for this text in Luke 11, beginning in verse 29, what I read today, the background goes all the way back to verse 14. You go back to verse 14 in Luke 11, you see that Jesus has cast out a demon that caused a man to be mute, couldn't speak, and if you look at Matthew's version, you find out he was blind as well. So Jesus performs this marvelous miracle, healing a man who could not speak and who could not see. Now, There were three reactions to that. Many marveled, Luke tells us. So one reaction was what was common when Jesus did miracles. Many marveled, but not all. The opposition is increasing by this time, and we're going to see it from now until the end of Luke. And the opposition says, listen, people, this isn't God. I know you think this has got to work. This isn't God. This was Satan. This is Jesus operating in the power of Satan. You remember Jesus answered that as we saw a couple weeks ago in verses 17 through 28. But now we come to that third group that are sitting on the fence. And so in verse 16, they say to test him, they kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. That's what he begins to deal with beginning in verse 29. So now he's coming back to those folks. And he's going to give us in the next few verses four very helpful principles dealing with how we should look at signs and miracles and wonders, a part they should play, and how we should view them. So four principles, two today, two next week as we continue that sermon. The first principle that he gives us is one sign is never enough. One Sign is never enough. That's one of the great problems with signs. Faith that results from signs always needs another sign. The reason for that is really simple. It's because faith is is now focused on the sign, not on the sign giver. It's like, and I've seen this happen, it's like trying to find your way to Disneyland. You're following all the signs and you keep following the signs and pretty soon you miss the great Matterhorn out the right-hand side of your car that would tell you exactly where to go. You're looking at the signs instead of the place you really, instead of reality, where you really want to get. We're easy to get defocused when we get signs. Faith is placed in the signs, not in the Savior. We see this in verse 16. Jesus has just, remember, Jesus has just restored the health of this blind and mute man. And these people say, while others to test him kept seeking for him a sign from heaven. Despite the tremendous marvel they had just seen, and despite the miracles that he's been doing all over Palestine at this point in time, including raising people from the dead, despite all of that, they demand more. Why? Because faith based in signs always needs another sign. If God did it today, he must do it tomorrow. And so the faith becomes in in the signs and not in the sign giver. Jesus had an opinion about these people. It's in verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. I, 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 you know, don't miss this. These, folks, these are the people who are coming to synagogue every week. They're the people like us. They're coming to church. But they're looking for a sign. They want their miracle today. And Jesus says, you are an evil generation, evil, paneros. It's the same word he uses when he talks about Satan being the evil one. Remember, they've just said, you are doing these works by the power of Satan. You're in bed with Satan. And Jesus is saying, turn the tables on him completely and said, no, it's not me. It's you that are in bed with Satan. Because you're demanding of God that which is God's prerogative to give. Is it okay to ask? Yes. Is it okay to demand? Never. You're an evil generation. He sees that this is coming from a heart of unbelief in the first place. 
an evil generation. He knows that faith built on signs isn't faith at all. It's just a desire to use God. Jesus has seen it all before. He's seen it all before. He's seen it back in the time of Israel when after Israel was freed from that bondage in Egypt, Moses had done all these signs. They got out, and now they're out of Egypt. They're ready to go into the land of Canaan that God has promised them, and so they're standing on the border, and Moses sends two spies in to look the land over and to decide how they're going to do this. Not if they're going to do it, but how they're going to do it. Twelve spies, did I say two? Twelve. Spy. I know that. I read that. Twelve spies go into the land. And those 12 spies came, come back. And you remember that two of them gave a great report, Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua said, wow, great place, wonderful land. Anything grows there. You just throw the seed on the ground and it grows. It's wonderful. It's flowing with milk and honey. Yeah, there's some, there's some powerful tribes there. But God has lifted the protection from them. We can take them. Let's go. And then there are the other 10 spies. The other 10 guys, they said, whoa, we can't go in there. Those guys are, I mean, there's some fearsome dudes in that place. They are tall. In Numbers 13, in 13 verse 33, they say, it seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. What they're saying is, we felt like grasshoppers in their presence, and when they looked at us, they thought we were grasshoppers. They're totally focused on the circumstances. They were right. There were some fearsome, tall people over there, but God had lifted their protection. But guess who the people listened to? In Numbers 14, verse 2, we read this. It says, And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. They kept, remember how many times they said that in, in, the, in the wilderness? Wish we had died in Egypt. Uh, or would that we had died in this wilderness be better to be dead than to go face those guys? Now you've got to remember, beloved, these people who are saying this had seen the greatest array of miracles that had ever happened up until that point in time. They had seen God on their behalf destroy the greatest army in the world. It'd be like you come up against some issue and God destroys the, the whole Russian army on your behalf. These people knew miracles. The problem was they didn't know the miracle worker. Huge difference. Far more important to know the miracle worker than to know the miracle. God says this in Numbers 14, 11. He says, if you want his opinion, he said, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? Jesus had seen it. He'd seen it all before. When, base, when faith is based in signs, there's always a need for one more. Jesus saw it in his own time. John chapter 6, if you're in Luke 11, just turn over to John 6. You remember the occasion. We've looked at it before. Jesus, Jesus fed 5,000 of these people one day with five loaves and two fish. So they all believed, right? They came to faith in Christ, right? I wish I could say that's what happened. We know that what happened was the next day when they woke up and found that Jesus had left, they followed after him. They ran after him. They figured where he had gone back toward Capernaum, and they came back that direction. They finally found him. They were looking to make him king. They wanted a king who would give them food on demand. They thought that would be a great thing. Jesus challenges them in John 6, verse 27. There's a whole big, long dialogue in here. You should read sometime. But in 627, Jesus says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Believe in me. Have faith in me. Not in the miracles. Have faith in me. 
So they do, right? Well, not quite. Verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? I mean, think about it. This is incredible. He's just fed 5,000 of them out of virtually nothing, right? And they're saying, well, yeah, we'll believe in you, but, you know, we need another sign. One sign is never enough, beloved. Sad end of this story is in verse 66. Look at it. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Faith that is dependent on signs, you see, is not true faith. So what? So we should never pray for a miracle? Absolutely not, beloved. Pray for the miracle. But listen, focus on believing the one who either gives it or doesn't, depending on his providence. Do you see the difference? Look, you know, if you want an example, look at Daniel 3. And I'm going to take you there. You need some homework. Look at Daniel 3 and read it. You'll see a perfect example of this. How you ask for the miracle, but you believe God, whatever he gives. That's faith. Faith isn't when you can ask for whatever you want and you know you're going to get it. That's not faith. That's just asking for something. Faith is when you believe in God regardless of what happens. So no, we're not saying don't pray for a miracle. We're saying believe God no matter what. I know many Christians whose Faith just has gone down the drain. Their whole life defeated lies because they didn't get the miracle this week. They didn't get the miracle this month. Or God didn't do it the same way this time that he did it last time. It's God in a box. God doesn't go in boxes. The trouble with signs is it always takes just more. Second principle from these in this passage back in Luke 11. Second principle, the ultimate sign has already been given. The ultimate sign has already been given. In verses 29 through 36 here, Jesus specifically answers this demand that he give another sign In the first part, verses 29 through 32, he identifies two witnesses who will testify against his audience at the judgment of the last day. Now keep in mind, these are the church-going, you know, righteous people, moral, upright, self-righteous. They're doing everything they can to keep the law. They think they're getting it all right. And yet Jesus says, listen, let me tell you what's going to happen later. Two people are going to stand up in judgment against you. Both of them are non-Jews, pagan background. One of them comes from your greatest enemy, Nineveh, which is Assyria, which was a horrible enemy of Israel. He says, those are the people that are going to stand up against you in the judgment because of your wickedness. Because of your wickedness. And seeking a sign instead of seeking me. Now each of those two people presents a different lesson about signs. The lesson of Jonah is the ultimate sign has already been given. That's the one we want to look at today. The ultimate sign has already been given. Verse 29, when the crowds were increasing, began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Their demand for a sign, you see, implied that Jesus hadn't already done enough. In other words, what they're doing is they're, they're blaming their unbelief on Jesus. That's why they're called wicked. They're basically saying, if you just do what we ask, then we would believe in you. Jesus calls them on that. It's a wicked request because it comes from a heart of rebellion, really because he didn't do what they expected, what they wanted, the way they wanted it done. They didn't believe in him. Jesus quickly lets them know he doesn't answer to them, they answer to him. He says this, no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So so now the question is, well, what is the sign of Jonah? 
Some have pointed to verse 32. Look at that. And they, it says, they, for they, the Ninevites, repented at the preaching of Jonah. And they suggest, well, the sign of Jonah then must have been his preaching. And under that interpretation, the idea is that, hey, those pagans in Nineveh, the, those, those people, this one guy, Jonah, goes in there and, and, and preaches, and, and they come to repentance. No signs, no miracles, no anything. They just, Jonah preaches, and they come to repentance. And so, and so that's the sign of Jonah, despite that. And, and, and here you are, you people have these incredible miracles, and you have the greatest preacher in history in the person of Jesus, and yet you won't repent. So the sign is the preaching of Jonah. Well, all of those things are true, but I don't think that's the sign. That's not what he means when he says the sign of Jonah. You say, why do you say that? Well, number one, first of all, the word sign in the Bible inevitably means a miracle. Almost always means something that defies nature. Preaching is an act. It's not a sign. It's an act. Secondly, the sign is Jonah himself, if you look at this real closely, not his preaching. It's Jonah himself, and Jesus is the ultimate self, uh, sign, Jesus himself, not his preaching. Look at it again in verse 30, for as Jonah became a sign, Jonah the person, not Jonah's preaching. As Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be a sign to this generation. So the sign is wrapped up in the men, in the people. But the third reason for believing that the sign isn't the preaching, it's something else, is, is, an, interpretive, is an interpretive principle that will help us here. The, the, the hermeneutical or, or interpretive principle is called the analogy of Scripture, or stated another way, Scripture interprets Scripture. Sometimes that's a very helpful thing to do, and in this case, it turns out to be really helpful because Matthew tells us exactly what the sign is. So all we got to do is turn to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, and we will see what the sign is. Matthew 12 and verse 40. Matthew, giving us insight into the same account, says this, he says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That removes the ambiguity, does it not? The sign is the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is going to be coming, of which Jonah was a prefigurement or a foreshadowing or a type or a pattern. Any of those Words will work. Jesus is saying that Jonah points forward to what's about to happen to him. Now, Jonah's experience was, the two experiences were different in some regards, right? Because in verse 32, he says something greater than Jonah is here. So you would expect it to be a little different. That something greater than Jonah is actually someone who's greater than Jonah. That someone being Jesus. And whereas Jonah nearly died, Jesus actually died. Whereas Jonah regained a life that appeared lost, retained a life that appeared lost, Jesus actually regained a life that was lost. Whereas Jonah's experience resulted in the physical salvation of the sailors who threw him overboard where the fish could get him, Jesus' death and resurrection resulted in the spiritual life of anyone who will believe in him. Including, by the way, all those people in Nineveh who repented. Isn't that a wonderful thing that they did? They repented, and this death and resurrection of Jesus was good not only for them, but it was the ultimate sign for anybody, everywhere, anywhere, anytime, who will believe in him. Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. Now, it's interesting when you look at Jonah. Jesse read that account for us this morning. You, you should have seen many things there that were instructive. Why was Jonah a sign? Because he was delivered from something that was basically undeliverable. 
right? He's in the belly of a fish with nowhere to go and no way out. The only possible way he could get out is that, is that God did a miracle and allowed him to escape. And so Jesus had victory over death because, because he was resurrected out of that death where there was no escape from a physical perspective. Now Jonah goes down to Nineveh and he begins to preach to those people. And if you, if you were listening carefully, you noticed, uh, you noticed how seeker sensitive his message was. Jonah, Jonah's message was, if you read it, you guys got 40 days and you're going to die. That was his message. He didn't bother to say, unless you repent. I, dare you, I defy you to find that in that passage because it isn't there. Now, I have to believe if he was actually a sign to those people, he must have told them something about his deliverance. I, I'm guessing he couched it a little differently than we might think. He might say, folks, the only reason I'm here, God didn't give me any choice. I was thrown overboard. I was in the belly of a, of a fish for three days and three nights, and he delivered me, so here I am. But here's my message. You're going to die. But they saw the sign. They saw the deliverance. They understood the God behind that. And I don't know, I may be being hard on, on Jonah. We don't really know, but I'll tell you what, if, if Jonah said, repent, and you won't have to do this, it's not there. They repented because the king said, maybe. Remember how he said that? Maybe. Maybe God will relent. And so they repented. What I love about all of this is it's because Jonah became a sign to them because having heard, having heard, faith comes by hearing. Remember Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, having heard, not seen the sign, but having heard, these Ninevites turned to God. And here's Jesus' audience having full exposure to all the miracles that Jesus is doing here, there, and everywhere, having full expo exposure to his preaching, that was with great authority, that he never opened his mouth when people said, wow, we never heard it like this before. So hearing the greatest preaching in the history of the world, seeing the greatest miracles in the history of the world, yet they rejected. How could that be? It just shows the depth of the depravity of the human heart, beloved. And Jesus says, I'll tell you what, the Ninevites that I know you hate are gonna stand up in judgment and help explain why you are being condemned. Because they believed. From the beginning of his, of, his, of his ministry, Jesus saw his death and resurrection as being the ultimate sign. Did you know that? Look at John 2, John chapter 2. This is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John 2. He's cleansing the temple it's the house of God. It's overrun with commercialism. The high priests, under the high priest and the Sadducees, who were the guys that were basically in charge, they had set up uh, ways for people to buy animals for sacrifice and to change money because they were coming from many places outside the country. And the temple demanded Jewish money and so they could change the money there, but they did it at exorbitant rates. They charged exorbitant rates for the animals. And so they were making huge amounts of money on the Jewish people, and Jesus came in and cleansed the temple, drove them out. He d he'll do it at the end of his ministry as well. We'll see that in the book of Luke. But he did it at the beginning. In fact, it even says he took a, you know, a rope and just drove the animals out. It was an amazing thing. So look at John 2, beginning in verse 18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? In other words, what authority do you have? Let's see you demonstrate that you have authority. What sign? Give us a sign. Show us something. Show us what you're made out of. Look how Jesus answers in verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, which wasn't completed yet at that point in time. 36 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his what? His body. 
The disciples didn't get it either. They remembered it later and then they got it. But what's Jesus doing? Right at the beginning of his ministry, he's pointing to his coming death and resurrection as the ultimate sign. There is no greater sign than that. This is it. Now in this case, he's looking forward to it. In our case, you know, we have the great privilege that we look back on it. But that's what he's pointing to. Jesus is saying a new day has arrived. There's a new temple. There's a new way that God's going to meet man. Not in the physical temple anymore, but in my person. And it'll be based on my death and resurrection in your behalf. Look at this verse 22 of John 2. When therefore he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Took him a long time to come around to it, didn't it? But it was the ultimate sign. Now Jesus, Jesus in John 2 as well as in Luke 11 is pointing people to the sign of Jonah's experience as something that's going to prefigure what he's about to do. He's now just weeks away from doing this in Jerusalem. It was coming soon. That was going to be the ultimate sign. He said, you're not going to get any other sign except that one. My death and my resurrection. But you will get that. It was soon to come. These people saw that. The question is, did, they, did any of them believe? We don't know. We do know that it wasn't long after his resurrection that the disciples began to preach on the streets of Jerusalem and 3,000 in one day came to Christ. Another day, 5,000 came to Christ in a single day. So thousands of people literally were coming to Christ. I have to believe some of them were the ones that were in this crowd this day. They were putting it together just like the disciples were. It was on the basis of the ultimate sign that many believed. But now, beloved, the question for us is, what are we going to do with Jesus Christ? Because that ultimate sign for them that they were looking forward to is one that we can look back on and we can see that it's actually happened. The death and, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is real. It's happened. And Jesus is saying, that's the ultimate sign. If you, if, that's the sign that makes all other signs passe. I don't care what else I do for you. That's the ultimate sign. If you won't believe that sign, you won't believe any sign. The resurrection is ultimate, which is exactly, by the way, why Paul said in Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? The resurrection is the key thing. The trouble with seeking further signs is the ultimate sign has already been given. You reject it and hope is gone. Kind of like the little boy named Sammy was sitting in his room one night and he was playing around. He'd, he, he found some money and he, and he accidentally swallowed a penny. Well, he started crying. He was scared to death. You know, he didn't know what the impact would be from swallowing this penny. And so Dad walked into the room thinking fast. You know, he palmed a penny out of his pocket and he pulled a penny out of, the, out of Sammy's ear. Well, Sammy was delighted. He, he stopped crying. He got happy right away. He grabbed the penny from Dad and then before anybody could do anything, he swallowed it again. <laughs> and then you know what he said, right? Do it again, Dad. Do it again. One sign is never enough. Do it again. Do it again. It's what we say to Jesus, isn't it? Prove yourself again. Do it for me. And you know what God is saying? God is saying, I, I already did it for you. I already did it for you. Look at the cross and look at the empty tomb. That was me. I can't do anything more for you than I've already done. Josh McDowell, you know, entered college looking for a good time. Sound familiar? Went to college looking for a good time, and he was having one. He'd given up on religion long ago, so the, the, the constraints were off. And a young woman invited him to a Bible study. And he said, well, Bible study, what do you do there? What do you talk about? And she said, Jesus Christ. And he said, ah, 
I, I don't want anything to do with that religious stuff. She said, I didn't say anything about religion. I said, we talk about Jesus Christ. <laughs> so you know, you know how God grabs people? You know how he just gets them? Uh, against every desire of his heart, he found himself at the Bible study. And when he got there, he felt comfortable to express himself. He didn't believe in religion. He didn't believe that Jesus Christ was real. And so the guys at the Bible study challenged him. They said, why don't you go, why don't you do this? Go prove that the resurrection of Jesus wasn't real. And so Josh McDowell thought, that's a great idea. You know, the ways God gets people are amazing, right? Why would you waste your time going and proving Jesus isn't real if you didn't believe in him in the first place? But that's what he did. He took the challenge and he went out and he began to research and, began to, and he kept researching and he kept researching. And, and the end of his research became a book, the, the most, one of the greatest apologetic books of my generation called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which puts all the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the table. Because he didn't find out that Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead. He found out that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And it changed his whole life. He found the greatest sign, beloved. He found the ultimate sign. The greatest evidence of that resurrection is the apostles themselves. Where could you find 11 weaker, more spineless guys than this who ran away when the crucifixion was happening? And yet eventually, every single one of those guys gave their lives in far-flung places in the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, you, think about this. You, nobody dies for a lie, right? And these guys were in a position to absolutely know. It wasn't like they thought maybe or on the basis of somebody that taught them that Jesus rose from the dead. They knew They had either seen Jesus or they hadn't, and they claimed to have seen him, and they died for that faith. Nobody dies for a lie. The ultimate sign had been given. Somebody asked Josh McDowell why he came to faith in Christ. He said, for the very simple reason, I am not able to explain away an event in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the sign that counts. That's the sign, listen carefully now, that's the sign that will either save you or condemn you, one or the other. And that's where your choice comes into play. Let's pray. Father, it's, uh, it's very clear. When we, when we really think about the message last week, the message this week, you've done all you could possibly do, all you could possibly do, to demonstrate yourself in history. You've done everything that's reasonable to do to make that message known, to create a permanent record of that message. And then you've asked us to live by faith because, well, that's because that's how you've chosen to do it. So Lord, we pray. If there's anyone here this morning who has never invited you to be part of their life. Pray that they would do that right now. Pray that they would open their heart to you just by saying, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and for my sins. I, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I, I try not to. I want to be a good person, but I still fail. And so I fall short of God's glory. Thank you for dying for me. I accept your death in my place. I accept the righteousness of Jesus as mine. Thank you for saving me. You would never turn away a prayer like that. So I pray that our hearts will be turned toward you. And Lord, those of us who know you, may we be reaffirmed in our faith. May we never fail to ask you for whatever we think is in your will, but Lord, help us to accept whatever the answer is that's coming from you because we are looking at you, not at the sign. Signs are independable. You never are. So thankful for that. So bless us as we sing together, Lord, this closing hymn. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.